All right, everybody. Well, I think uh, it's about that time to kick off our 2021 Magnum Stone Virtual Summit. We've got a really great lineup of information here for you today, everything from installation to design information. Uh, so we're going to get into that here briefly. Uh, first of all, we want to thank on behalf of the Magnum Stone team, thank everybody for taking the time to join us here today. Uh, just from a quick scan of the list, it looks like we've got people from all over the world here. We've got Australia, New Zealand, uh, fellow Canadians, uh, people joining from the USA. Uh, we've even, looks like we've got some uh, some attendees from Sweden and Iceland as well. So that is excellent to see, excellent to see. Awesome. Well, uh, again, thank you for joining us. And uh, with that, why don't we dive right into our 2021 Magnum Stone Virtual Summit. Thanks, Dave. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to the Magnum Stone Summit. Uh, this is our very first uh, webinar and online uh, experience or, or showing stuff like this. So bear with us if we have any technical difficulties and, and thanks for the incredible turnout. Uh, we did not expect, uh, we, we almost sold out of all of our tickets. So pretty, pretty exciting. Um, so hopefully we will entertain you and you'll learn a little something. Um, so I'm going to request control here. Okay, so I'm going to go through uh, the block components, design options, uh, advantages of Magnum Stone, and the different wall types. Uh, and I'm going to end with a case study that we just uh, we just got recently, which is which is pretty interesting, and a lot of people have been asking for this type of uh, a situation. So um, I'm going to go to the next slide here. So the very first part is the block components. I'm going to do something a little bit different, uh, which I think a few of you will find kind of interesting. I'm going to do a 3D demo of, uh, of Magnum Stone. So I'm going to go through all the kind of blocks and components, how they go together uh, in a virtual setting. So uh, it's kind of fun and different. Um, so as you can see here, we have our standard Magnum Stone blocks. They are four feet wide. Uh, 1.2 meters, so we're going to kind of flip back and forth between metric and imperial. Um, two feet high, so 0.6 of a meter, and two feet deep, 0.6 of a, a meter back. Um, so these are the, the standard blocks. Now, a standard magnum stone block is over here on the left, and we have what we call our secure lugs that connect, give our batter, uh, give our alignment, and our connection. So it kind of uh, puts it all together. You can see that we have a really, really deep groove at the top, and that's where the, the lugs sit into. Um, we have a top block, so the same mold creates all of these, these, these block components that you see. Um, and the top block, we can actually just block out the back and put the soil right up to the front. Um, so it's kind of unique. And then we have our base block, so we literally manufacture without uh, the lugs on the bottom. So what you'll see is uh, back here, we have it with a block out in. So if you're doing a positive connection, um, you can wrap the grids inside. But most of the blocks now will have this block out inside of it. So I'm actually going to just really quickly uh, build a wall to kind of demonstrate how this works. Kind of fun uh, and different, I guess. So we'll put four blocks in the base row. And Vern is going to get into real, uh, you know, the details of how this actually goes together from an installation standpoint in the next module. So again, I'm just kind of giving you a, a broad stroke of how this all works. Uh, we'll interlock the standard unit within the base block. And then how the lug sits inside. 
I won't spend too much time on getting into the, the, the nitty gritty of it. But what we see here is that we have a uh, 1.2 meter retaining wall. It's about six feet, roughly, which we can build in almost any situation. Uh, you know, we'll have the, the embedment coming up to the toe of the wall here. So that's the standard components of magnum stone. Now, we also have end caps and corners. So the end cap and corner attached to the side of the block, it's a bit unique in the fact that it is kind of a cap rather than a full block corner. Um, it attaches either mechanically or we wrap it around kind of the armpit of, of the block. Uh, there's probably gonna be a lot of questions about the faces. Um, there's a lot of different faces around the world so what we're showing here is, uh, you know, one of our ledge faces that we offer. So you have to ask your, your local manufacturer which one they make. Um, and it has a lot of different textures to it, and it makes kind of magazine unique. But all of the components that we're showing are available in all areas of the world. So whether you have a, a, a different ledge face or a smooth face, uh, it doesn't really matter. Next, we have the half high block. So the half high is used usually for transitions either at the base of the wall or at the top of the wall. Uh, so you're doing a step up in your base. You can actually eliminate a lot of square footage by using a half high block. And it's literally half high. So it's 0.6 of a meter or one foot high by the same, you know, four feet, 1.2 meters uh, width. And with that, we have the exact same kind of components and block outs. So we have a standard block which probably isn't used as much as the uh, as the top and the base block. Um, and then we have a base block, like I was saying, which we can use in, in the elevation changes, and a top block, which uses a block out as well. So we can actually just kind of attach a couple to our the wall that we're building here, just kind of for fun. Um, it's really strange, I must say, not being able to interact and talk to people. So uh, this is... As Dave was saying earlier, this is very unnatural. So I apologize if uh, if it all sounds a little weird because there's no there's no feedback. Usually we'll have questions and, and stuff like that that we can talk about. So uh, I apologize about that. So that was a half high. So next you'll see our extenders. So this is something really unique to Magnum Stone that uh, you know differentiates us from a lot of the other systems that are out there. Um, having our lo large hollow core, of course, we've we've done that from the very beginning about uh, 15 years ago. And now we have these extenders. So you see this notch out out of the back. We use that uh, in the manufacturing process. It's a block out. So we have two different sized extender units that attach tongue and groove to the back of the block or to each other. Now we can change this into uh, you know two foot increments, uh, 0.6 of a meter. So it attaches literally to the back and uses kind of like almost like a dead man unit uh, within the system. So it relies on the mass of the of the of the block as well as the gravel that sits inside the hollow core and within that extender unit. So with that, we can actually build large gravity walls and we can keep attaching extender to extender. So the two foot or the 0 0.6 meter extender is always gonna be at the back of the wall. Um, and as far as like heights, right now the tallest wall we have is uh, about 30 feet roughly, I think in Maryland uh, or near DC. And uh, so I think it's got two four foot 1.2 meter extenders attached to each other and maybe one uh, 0.6 meter attached at the back. So the advantage to gravity walls, and we're really going to get into this uh, later on in the, in the presentation in the webinar series, it is that we can really eliminate the excavation cut as opposed to a geo grid wall. Um, so having those those two or one foot increments, sorry, two foot increments, 0.6 meters, uh, really allows us to cut back on the excavation and saving property lines and stuff like that. Um, so it's a really unique feature that uh, that Magnumstone offers. Radius. Uh, so this would be at the very, very top of the wall. Uh, we have 5.4 meters or an 18 foot, sorry, diameter, not radius. Um, 
And as we step down, that's going to increase. So it's very, very rare that we see something with this tight of a, of a radius anywhere. But because of that, you know, the wedge on the sides, we can do some really nice, uh, nice curves with magnum stone. Um, and then we'll go into the step ups. So I just wanted to kind of, I have another slide as well, but to show you quickly how those half highs work. So if we had a regular stepped up base wall, we can eliminate a lot of square footage by using the half highs. So we actually eliminated uh, about one, two, three, four, five blocks. Uh, so about 20 square feet approximately by using these half high uh, components. So it's just something a little bit uh, a bit unique and we can do the same thing with the step ups uh, on the on the wall top. So um, that kind of wraps up the virtual side of the uh, Magnum Stone wall. And uh, if you have any questions, for sure, I'll, I'll be happy to answer them um, in this kind of different setting. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And go back into the presentation. Okay. So uh, I already did the 3D demo, but I was trying to, uh, you know, talk about the blocks basically. So it is eight square foot as as far as a face. Uh, of a block, so 0.73 square meters. We've gone through the dimensions and hollow core. Uh, the weight is 1,400 pounds, about 635 uh, kilograms. So it's it's a relatively lightweight, large block system. So we, we talk a lot about that with the hollow core and the advantages that go along uh, with that. So as far as design options go, uh, we're not going to go through every single scenario necessarily, um, but we wanted to again give you kind of the broad strokes of, of what, what it can do. So with anything, uh, if you're an engineer or an installer or a designer, uh, you know, options are critical and we can't be limited by the block on what we can do on site. So because site changes are constant, uh, we need products that can adapt to the environment. So the design flexibility uh, is needed nowadays, and we have to have products that can suit that. Um, so what we have on the top left is, is a standard kind of geogrid wall. Uh, most people should be familiar with that. Um, we have some really good uh, installation manuals uh, to show. Then we have gravity walls. Gravity walls are probably the fastest growing uh, that we've seen in the last kind of three to five years as far as retaining wall you know, design goes and installations. Um, then we have plantable green walls. Go into a little bit of uh, detail of that. Positive connection on the bottom left here. We actually have uh, it wraps through the hollow core of the block. Uh, and then we have soil anchoring and uh, cantilever. So because we have this hollow core, we can actually put rebar and concrete through the block uh, in those really extreme scenarios. We don't see too many walls like that, but but there are a few uh, that we've done and, and we have a few case studies on. So that's kind of the, the options that we have. Uh, slide. So another unique thing about uh, Magnum Stone, again, through that hollow core, is we have that, uh, that vertical drainage and horizontal drainage. So it's, it's integral within the block. So we don't have to put a drainage column behind we can there's no limitations to that but having it through the block kind of provides a lot of advantages uh, from an installer point of view uh, and a design point of view so if we have those water applications where which are very very fast growing as well shipping and freight so here we have uh, you know because again the hollow core and the large face of the block we can put more square meters on a truck uh, so we have less truckloads to a site. So if we had just, you know, again, this is a very rough calculations, but a 4,000 square foot project, you know, we could probably get in about 31 loads with a 45,000 pound capacity and depending on the truck bed uh, limits. So if it was solid block, 
we'd have 44 truckloads. So we have a really large savings in not only freight, uh, but also the CO2 emissions. Uh, we have way less and from an environmental standpoint and all that. So we're trying to optimize uh, the big block situation. So this was this example that I had uh, with the 3D images showing the, the top of wall and how we can transition. So, um, you know, generally speaking, big blocks are not known to have nice transitions at the top or at the bottom of the block uh, of the wall. So, you know, using uh, the cap stone, they're not always offered as far as a, a cap stone. So you'll have to check with your manufacturer, but the end cap uh, with the half high or standard has a really nice transition, uh, both at the top and the bottom of the wall. So I think I showed this in the uh, in the 3D example, but uh, you know we have 20 square feet less of material by doing a half high transition. So so those really really big walls, uh, you know, one of uh, one of our really good reps down in in Maryland recently was allowed was able to eliminate about a thousand square feet of material. Uh, by using a half high transition. So there are situations where it's it's needed and important. Uh, from an installer standpoint, there might be a few more uh, base elevation changes, but you know what, I guess it depends on what, uh, what drives the, the cost of the project. So installation, uh, this is a huge one. You know, labor is, is almost uh, no longer there anymore. So everyone is trying to use as much equipment as they can. Um, so with Magnum Stone, we can install, uh, you know, with a small a small hole like this one, uh, just a two foot uh, or two ton Komatsu. Uh, labor is expensive. We want our machines to work. So if we can install eight square feet, you know, 0.73 square meters at a time, it's a huge advantage. Um, from a, an installer or even a, a site contractor who can do it himself. Um, it's not always the situation, but once in a while they have to. Um, we can also have less geogrid. So because we're going up two foot increments, 0.6 of a meter, uh, we don't have to do like with, with the small blocks having it every, uh, every eight inches or, or 16 inches. Um, and then in certain situations we have less compaction. So we still have compaction no matter what, uh, but if we have a gravity wall and we're dropping in that uh, that number 57 stone, but a 40 mil aggregate that's clean, uh, we don't have to, you know, when we have clay and sand, we really have to compact that in those lifts that are about, you know, eight inches high. So there is advantages in the fact that we we don't have to, uh, you know, get the, proc the proctor out and, and uh, check density when we're doing a gravity wall like that. So uh, geogrid walls, um, you know, we can install them in, in two foot increments going up. Uh, you can see that we have an, a superior connection with that uh, secure lug that pinches the grid between the block in the hollow core. Um, and because we're at, at a two foot height, uh, 0.6 meter, the grid goes in every 0.6 uh, of a meter. So I, I think I touched on it a little earlier, but uh, it's just another advantage. And the lugs have a nice alignment that attach to it. So we have plenty of, uh, of walls out there that have geo grid, excuse me. Um, typically speaking, you know, they're, they're all heights between six to 30 feet, you know, two to 10 meters and higher. Um, they become more cost eff effective as you get taller, of course, uh, because there's a certain point where those gravity walls just kind of get expensive for material cost. Um, and the length, so typically speaking, you know, as a general rule, we're about 0.7 height of wall for grid going back from the face of the wall. So that's where, you know, as land gets tougher and tougher to, uh, to develop, those property lines become uh, very valuable. So where gravity wall comes in is that we can reduce that amount. So as a general rule, it's about 0.7 height. Uh, I know where I am, it's more like one to one. So if we've got a, a you know, 20 foot, a 10 meter high wall, those grid lengths are about 10 meters. So uh, um, that's kind of a, a general rule for that. Uh, so gravity walls, um, we touched on a little bit with the six foot high and attaching those uh, extenders together. So again, as a general rule, we're at about 0.5 H 
in a perfect scenario, we can get 0.4. So a 10 foot wall, we could have a four foot excavation. Um, that doesn't necessarily follow you know, OSHA standards uh, for the cut of the wall. So you have to follow local you know, guidelines and regulations, um, but we can increase property lines by doing this and, and also customize it by doing the extenders at a, at a two foot increment. Um, and the really nice part about this and, and what we're seeing often is being able to use uh, utility lines within that segment. I don't know if you can see my, my mouse or not, but having those concrete pipes uh, we'll talk concrete because everybody here is uh, typically in the concrete industry. So uh, uh, we could put those pipes right in that uh, excavation zone uh, without impacting the wall. So it's a really, really nice advantage for, uh, you know, if, if you have a service that you have to go back into and dig up, we don't have those grids there any longer that, uh, that could intrude in that or impede on it. So this is... Uh, an example of a wall recently built. Um, they had to move a stream bed and put the extenders in. I think they, and they, ha they didn't have the room for the property line at the back of the uh, of the house uh, or apartment building. We'll have that case study up, I would imagine, in the next uh, uh, month or so. So it relies on the mass of the blocks uh, and connected by tongue and groove. And and again, it's the same system. So. Whether we're using a smooth face or our, our field face, which was the original one, um, it doesn't matter because it all interlocks the same way. Uh, so the, we get this question quite often and kind of where's the sweet spot for these gravity walls uh, where you're kind of saving money uh, and it's not getting, uh, you know, overbearing on the cost. And we really do see that, you know, from two feet to 15 feet or one to five meters that's kind of the wheelhouse of where your economical, you're saving money uh, on, on installation and land and also product. Above that, generally speaking, grid will be less expensive um, from both installation and material cost. But again, that's kind of general. A lot of times we just don't have that property. We have to keep going higher and, and the material cost isn't necessarily uh, as important. So, and as you can see in this uh, photo, we do fill the back of the extenders in with, uh, with a clean aggregate that's free draining. So simple to install um, and, and provides, you know, less pressure. And, and from an installation standpoint, you don't have to compact in between those extenders. So it saves a lot of time. Uh, positive connection. So you know another really unique factor with magnum stone we can wrap that grid through the hollow core of the block um, and as you can kind of see it it wraps that soil mass uh, between the layers so on that the right back image there it actually pinches between the two um, so we do have to do some some really good compaction but it basically holds that the block within the soil mass which is really really unique with with a big block system like this we're seeing a lot more applications. Uh, I know New Zealand is doing a lot of these right now um, for seismic loading. So it's it's become almost a standard. If you if you've got anything with a, a Department of Transportation application uh, where connection is driving uh, the design, um, you can also see. And I think the next slide has it here. Oh no, uh, that we have 100% coverage. So because the 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 top of the block here, it wraps back, and then the bottom block, it's kind of hard to see in the demonstration, but we actually get a full 100% coverage of those geogrid layers. It's only the, the bottom and the top courses that will not have 100% coverage, but that's not going to really affect the design. So, you know, some of the other systems only have 70% coverage. Well, we have 100% coverage if, if we need to kind of go that route. Um, and a lot of the geogrid manufacturers, I think there's a few on here, uh, would also be willing to to cut, you know, to size for your grids. So that that two foot width. So when do we use it? Um, you know, Department of Transportation. When we have really really heavy loads at the top of the wall, seismic or, or where connection is driving the design of the retaining wall um, is where we do see positive connection uh, in these you know, in these really tall walls. 
Uh, plantable retaining walls. So this is, is this something we love here at Magnum Stone. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to be as environmentally friendly as we can in, in every aspect and everything that we do. And we know that this is kind of the future of, of our industry is trying to be as, as, as environmentally friendly as we can. So our large hollow core offers perfect planting pockets. Uh, they're really deep. We can even add irrigation if we needed to through that horizontal uh, channel. And we have walls, uh, you know, all over the wa world that are doing this. Um, so we, we can terrace it and we could put trees and shrubs in between. Um, you know, you'll have to talk to an arborist to see which ones, uh, you know, how much root they need to go down. Um, but it, it does, you know, reduce heat island effects and, and has a nice green environment to, uh, to a retaining wall. I mean, at the end of the day, a wall is a wall and it's a big concrete structure. Sometimes we want to break that up and have some nice uh, green aspects to it. Um, this is a really neat project in Australia that was done about five years ago. So they uh, they terraced the whole wall and it's, it's doing incredibly well. It's right in downtown Sydney uh, near the Opera House. We have a case study on our website that you can check out. Uh, we have lots here in, in my hometown in uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Uh, I think there's more green walls here than anywhere else in the world. Um, so again, we'll be we'll be sharing a lot more uh, case studies on these kind of projects as time goes on. Uh, so next is durability. Um, you know, I, I don't enjoy showing this one because we do also have a, a small block system. Uh, but this is just a reality, uh, you know, with dry cast concrete, it can be prone to deterioration, de-icing salts, uh, and, and spalling. So, you know, it's, it's not always like this, but it happens. So because magnum stone is poured as a wet cast uh, wall block, it just kind of keeps increasing in strength. So we can use it in salt water applications. So we don't have to worry about spalling uh, or deterioration from de-icing salts. So it's, it's a big advantage, and we know that a lot of uh, DOTs are, are really not specking small SRWs anymore for these reasons uh, when they're on the side of a highway or a bridge abutment. Um, <clears throat> so this is a neat project that uh, they actually refaced the wall. They didn't have to take it down and rebuilt it with magnum stone uh, refacing it. So, it, you know, it was a really old wall anyhow, um, but it just, uh, you know, has a nice look and... and uh, we don't have to worry about it spalling. Uh, aesthetics, of course, you know, we really are proud of, of the faces that we've we've created. Um, if you're not familiar with the production, the way that these are produced, <clears throat> we have a urethane liner that creates the face. So it's almost like a plastic uh, uh, matting that sits in the, on the base of it. So we can get some really, really aggressive textures uh, with the block. Um, so to talk to your local rep about, uh, you know, what face is offered um, around the world. So next we'll get into uh, a, a quick little case study and then I'll, I'll hand the, uh, the baton off to, to Vern Duick. Um, so this is a, a neat case study. It was just recently completed. Uh, it's Poplar Island over in uh, the Washington, uh, Maryland area. It's located on the eastern seaboard of the United States called the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, what happened was they had to reclaim a, a whole bunch of land. So it used to be for uh, British warships back in 1812 uh, and a retreat for the U.S. presidents of the 1930s and 40s. Um, farming and clear cutting on the island led to uh, erosion and, and just kind of destroyed the whole area. The island ended up being uh, decimated from all of the farming and, and clear cutting. So they they uh, <clears throat> they started a reclamation project uh, for the area and, and make a wildlife habitat, which was very strict. Uh, the plans were actioned by the U.S. Army Army Corps of Engineers uh, and Maryland Department of Transportation. Um, so they had some really really stringent uh, you know designs and, and stuff for the project. They used dredge materials for Chesapeake Bay and Port of Baltimore to restore land and create marshes and wetland contain containment dikes uh, for stone and gravel. So this is where magnum stone played a role. Um, 
it was selected to be the the, the big block on the uh, project and the site contractor had to install it himself so we had some, had to have something that was easy to use and uh, and and to ship as well so there's four walls total the wing walls that you can see uh, on that bottom slide all the material had to be barged in um, so we could get you know more square footage being an eight square foot block hollow core and then the extenders on the actual barge. So you can think about the mass of concrete that, you know, we take 40% uh, of that hollow core out of there that we can ship by barge, by truck, uh, for the whole project to the site. Uh, so it's pretty unique for, for Magnum Stone. Um, so they had to create an, a, an access road at the top of the wall. Um, the intent of the wall is to withstand shifting tides and, and weather from the Atlantic Ocean, so it is completely buried when it's completed. They had to have really good drainage so that when the water, you know, the tides come up and down, that the water can just leave the retaining wall. Um, and they needed a long-lasting block, so sadly the dry cast isn't going to work in this situation and you need a, a big block uh, wet cast retaining wall. The tallest point is about uh, 14 feet, so four meters high. With you can see at the very, very back here, they're actually installing uh, an extender uh, to an extender, so it attaches back to back. Uh, and then the environmental sustainability for habitat, so osprey, waterfowl, shorebirds, and marine life. So this was a. Uh, uh, an eco-friendly solution and Magnum Stone and, uh, and York Building Products uh, played a, a key role in this as well as uh, Keystone Concrete. Um, so there's less excavation for a gravity wall, uh, durability. They actually use 9% recycled content in the, uh, in the concrete of the manufacturing. So you can use recycled uh, uh, concrete inside the, the maximum block from a manufacturing standpoint. You just have to talk to uh, your local producer. We saved in transportation. Uh, they were able to use very small equipment, so they didn't have to bring in these these huge excavators to install the wall. And of course, the aesthetics. Uh, it looks good and it blends in with uh, the natural environment. So you know we're we're proud of this project, and we'll have we'll have plenty more coming up uh, in the future. So hopefully, I didn't go too fast here, but you know I wanted to thank you for your time. Um, that's kind of. Again, a very broad stroke of Magnum Stone and everything that it has to offer. Uh, Vern's going to get into the nitty gritty of the details and uh, of installation uh, coming up, and then Tolan will get into design. So, uh, thanks again, everybody, and, and looking forward to watching this uh, grow uh, and be successful with everybody out there. Vern will be talking very largely about the installation process for Magnum Stone. Of course, Magnum Stone was made by contractors for contractors, and that contractor is Vern himself. So I'm Vern Duick. Welcome, everybody. Um, I started in the hardscape industry installing pavers and segmental retaining walls back in the early 70s and have been working in Vancouver and in Seattle, both sides of Canada and U.S. We were installing probably about 500,000 square feet or 50,000 square meters of pavers every year and about 100,000, 10,000 square meters of walls every year. And uh, I learned a lot during those times. The Industry was very young, and we um, we didn't have a lot of technology or a lot of information on how to do things. So we learned on learned on on the site a lot. So I'll get started now on the anatomy of a gravity wall. We have our these subsoils down below. This should be well compacted before we install our leveling pad. There's one. There's two areas that we used to use a lot of filter fabric or soil separators 
One is between the leveling pad and the subsoils. I would put a filter fabric down there. And also at the very top, I would use this filter fabric separator, separating the fine soils from migrating down into the drainage chimney. The base leveling pad is, is approximately four feet or 1.2 meters wide and about a, a six to eight inches deep. The base unit is put down with no lugs. And one thing that I also did was I always backfill the lower part of this area with impermeable materials so that if any water came down to the reinforced zone, it would be led to the through wall detail. Drainage gravel inside the core, rebuilding the weight of the, the, the uh, mass. The um, backfill zone is backfilled in, in proper lifts, proper compaction. Another thing that I did, and I, I would dado or step my excavated back retained soils so there's a better interlock between the structure here with that retained soils. There's a typical batter on the wall, approximately um, 2.25 degrees. So that's sort of the anatomy of a typical gravity wall. The burial depth is approximately six, uh, six inches, 12 inches of uh, of the height of the wall on the typical gravity wall. <clears throat> I'm having trouble, Dave, on trying to get this thing to move. There we go. The um, Gravity walls, the base preparation is the most important part of the wall of the structure. Typically, we have again the six to eight inches, 15 to 20 centimeters of uh, soil depth. The soil separation fabric can be put in as an option. I would highly recommend it. One of the things on the on the projects, if the it had been raining the night before and this is a clay materials, and I put this base material right on top of that clay and put the compactor on it, that gravel would disappear very quickly down into the clay, contaminate the base leveling pad, and then I had to start all over again. So I and our company had a policy, we always put a base fabric separating these, these two soils, and that was our policy. Here you can see we have a a uh, 400 pound plate compactor, reversible plate. You can also use drum rollers in this area. Moisture in the soils is critical for proper compaction of any materials. We should be reaching about 95 proctor or greater. So um, do spend really important time on this, on the base prep, because that will show up in your, your final wall. As I said earlier, I was trying to figure out how to install most of these projects because there was very little information. And I had to teach all my crews. And one of the things that I did is I developed systems where I had a stakes on either side of the trench and had stakes down the trench. And there were saddles on top of these, on these yellow easy levels and I would put pipes across and those would be shot in with a laser level or a hand level. And then I had a 10 foot or three meter aluminum screed. And the final thin layer of gravel was put on top of that well compacted base. And then we would strike this off, screed it this way across the, across the trench. Our crews had about 10 or 12 of these so we could do about uh, 40, 50 feet of, of base prep. We would prepare the whole base until the next elevation change before we would lay any blocks on that base leveling pad. 
and then we'd reset and do the same thing for the next elevation change. Here you can see the, the, the crew is putting your first blocks down. They're placing the first blocks down onto, onto the base. This fellow is using a bar to control the swing and the level of that block and placing it so that they don't disturb that, that um, base leveling pad. Once this was in, these blocks were in, we never touched those blocks again. They were perfectly level front to back and block to block. We also made sure that we had a string line or a straight edge in the back of the area just to get that blocks lined up. On concave and convex curves, we used a three quarter inch plastic PVC pipe that had male, female ends and we clicked them together to make perfect convex concave curves. The final alignment was always done by a visual, and I would always use the inside front edge of that core as being my final alignment, because that's where your next core's lugs would fit against, and that was important. Your front face and your back, back units aren't always manufactured perfectly. This point is very perfect in the product. So that's what I use for my final alignment. Placing the, the next course, the second course, you can see the lugs interlocking with the units below, and they're on a stagger bond. One of the things that I would do is backfill in the front of the wall and in the back of the wall so that we didn't have any movement in that, level, that first course when we start setting that second course. So the, the sure, secure lugs are the units that is what engages that. There's a high shear strength in those units as well. Compaction is critical for durability of these projects. One of the nice things of a big solids or big hollow core system, a big block, heavy weight, is that we can bring our compacting equipment and right behind the block. This is always a sensitive area for failure, face failures. Lifts of the backfill zone is usually about eight to 12 inches, 20 to 30 centimeters per lift. And again, we should get this 95 proctor or greater. The backfill area should be level without any dips or doodles in it, especially on grid layers. The um, clear crushed gravel that's placed inside the hollow core has a number of different functions. One is it creates a free draining chimney for this for the wall system, but it also increases the weight of the unit. So each unit is weigh, weighs about 1,400 pounds, 635 kilos. When we put the gravel in, we build up the weight again, back up to, to, to uh, 2,200 pounds. And we also have that whole area interlocks. The gravel interlock between vertical and horizontal is, is, is just fabulous. <clears throat> you also have a lot of control on the amount of of material on site because that's your most expensive material. The extender, the gravity wall, the anatomy of this is very similar to the to your typical gravity wall, except that we have now extenders attached to the back of the unit, and we have gravel core filled inside that that zone. As Alan said, we can get our utilities behind that area and act access it without um, changing the, uh, the wall structure. The other nice thing about the hollow core, and this is what I'm going to talk a lot, a lot about the advantages of the hollow core, is that we can concrete core fill the upper courses in order to be able to marry up to anything that's on top. 
So that's a really nice system that, that allows it to work together. Typically, we are approximately 0.5 H to the height of the wall, which gives us a lot more ability to get closer to the property line. The, um, there we go. One of the things that we can do, even with the extenders attached to this, we can do some nice curves, fairly good tight curves on, on, con, on, on using the extenders. Filter fabrics can be used on the vertical behind, on, behind the units in order to protect the fines from migrating into the chimney be below. The, um, the uh, extender gravity wall, this is actually a geogrid re retaining wall system. This is a friction connection. As you can see, the anatomy of a geogrid retaining wall system is the same as, as your gravity wall, your base your gravel core fill, except now we have a geogrid layer that's placed in, inside the blocks. And, and those grid layers are approximately 0 0.7 to 0.8 inch of the wall. And they interlock by using three different components. The weight of the block, which is the friction, the deforming diff of the lugs of the grid, and the gravel interlock between the blocks provides you with a huge connection or sheer connection strength of that grid to block, which is always important when we design walls. And I'll show you some of the reasons that is. So here's a geogrid typical wall, backfilled. Layers are the same length uh, from top to bottom. Compaction of the backfill zone is absolutely critical that it's done properly and done in, in proper lifts. Different equipment can be used. If you have any clay in your materials, the only machine to use is a sheep's foot in order to get really good compaction. Again, this contractor has given us a really nice level area and the next grid layer is going to get laid down on a very nice flat surface. And that's quite important. Geogrids. There are two basic geogrids, a biaxle and a uniaxle. The biaxle grids has strength and equal strength in both directions. This one in the photo is a uniaxle grid. Your biaxle grids are mostly used in the residential small projects. Whereas your uniaxle grid is what's going to be used for most of your engineered systems. And they are placed and cut perpendicular to the wall. We have, um, there's probably about four or five different grid companies in the world, and Magnumstone has been tested with nearly all of them. Placing the geogrid on the wall, it's important that we get our geogrid as close to the front face as possible without showing through to the face. And you can see here that what's going to happen is the next course is going to push down, the lugs will push down into that, and the gravel core interlock will happen. This contractor used a his own homemade kind of tensioner. It is important to slightly tension the geogrid before backfilling. It's also important to backfill from the behind the wall and then back to the tail of the grid. In lifts of, uh, you know, I, this one, they, this is really good gravel. We can do it in 12 inch lifts. It's also important not to overlap our grids so that we don't have uh, differential um, shimming of the block in front. So do not overlap your grids and, and when you go into the face.
the um, positive connection system. Sorry guys, I'm having a little trouble trying to get this thing to click. There we go. Here's here's the positive connection. The grids are cut in two foot strips. They enter the bottom of the unit, go up the inside hollow core and back outside. This is a uh, positive connection that's most often required because of seismic loading, highways on top or railways, or any kind of water applications or really, really tall walls, you will need a, a um, positive connection in order to get a higher phase to a grid connection. Typically, if there's a 10 foot or three meter deep grid required, you're your lengths will be 22 feet or 6.7 meters of one strip, and that strip will go in, back out, and then up the, the top area. And you get 100% coverage, as Alan was talking about, between each layer, except for the very lowest cores and the very upper cores, you will have a 50% coverage. Here you can see the demonstration of this is, this grid comes out of the bottom, top of the bottom unit, this grid is going in the bottom of the upper unit. This also gives you, demonstrates on how, how we may have two to three different strengths of grids on a wall with the strongest grid in the bottom of the wall and weaker grids as we go to the top. Water applications. Water applications is one of the fastest growing walls that we're doing because of all the erosion and streams, rivers, lakes, and ocean fronts. There, the anatomy of a water application is a little different than the structure of um, gravity systems or geogrid walls. One thing is that there's we pillow wrap every material that's different than the, the existing soil so that we don't have any liquefaction or, or uh, we control those, those zones. The fabric is wrapped all the way around on this, this, this backfill zone, which is all select 57 or select uh, clear crushed gravel inside the core and behind. The filter fabric is also put in the front in order to protect the toe of the wall. We have a deeper burial in a water application than we would normally have. And then we finish it off with a riprap or rock finish on top, especially in fast running waters or wave actions. We don't want under undermining of that base, so it's really important to protect the toe of the wall in water application. The other thing that's important important is that this zone is free draining so that if you have rapid flooding or rapid drawdown that your drawdown and rapid flooding behind the wall is at, is equal to the front so we have equal pressures behind them and in front of those walls water applications are really sensitive to proper installation and construction Um, there we go. Here's a water application that was done. And you can see a great demonstration of convex concave curves. It's a huge project on a commercial area. There's waterfalls cascading over top of this project down into the pool or the lake. Um, this particular project was on a, this is a, a roadway going through and there's a through wall detail from one side to the other side to carry on with the water if there was. The nice thing about a hollow core, again, is that we can cut blocks to fit on site easily. And often we would concrete core fill these areas as well to prevent settlements. Here's three projects in water. This is a uh, this is a um, 
wire basket gravel core fill um, failure and they replaced it with magnum stone with guardrails on top and um, rip wrap all the way through the front of this it's a good example of what happens and this is a, a pretty fast running water and the front face really can take the shear which the, the baskets couldn't take this is a unique project that went through the backyards of of a, of a neighborhood and um, the contractor put some big through wall details you can see them down there and then also put ladders in escape ladders just in case kids got caught in here and then on top those concrete core filled with this with the fencing on top giving the backyards of the homes on either side as much room as possible this is a project where we had a through wall detail again and what we did is we concrete core filled all the units on on the sides of this and over top and steel reinforced it so that we didn't have differential settlement on either side of this uh, through wall detail so the hollow core provides us with great opportunities to to meet the needs on the projects Planable, the aesthetics, as, I'm, as um, Alan was talking about, is really important and also just softening the height of the wall. So we can take each course back approximately 18 inches with the back, back with the front face bearing on top of the back panel on each one of these units, filter fabric separated the soil planting soils from the drainage chimney or we can do one and then one on top so there's lots of flexibility on how we can create these plantable systems here's an example that was done on a public pool area and every course is plantable they also put a wrought iron fencing on top into the core but they also did a nice little bleacher effect for the kids to sit on on the very bottom wall we've done some um, bleachers for stadiums and um, and uh, football soccer fields it's really flexible in what we can do with the hall of core here are some terraced walls and one of the things that's really important is that we have enough burial on the second course in order to accommodate all the planting soils that go into the back area. Here you can see how they've been using the half high to change the elevation of the front of the wall and how they use that the planting soil is going to be right up against the base and back into the against the back units. A great example again of how perfectly this contract to create these convex concave curve. The other important thing from a structural point of view is if we have any vertical through wall vertical um, details or utilities behind the wall, geogrids need to be properly installed in this area. Go to our website. We have some really good examples of how this technically should be done. Here's another example of using half highs to change the elevation and softening this whole wall. Which could be a, this is a huge wall, but they've softened it by just creating these planting sub pockets. This is a boulder face, and uh, they've done some planting pockets or planting beds on this one as well to soften it with some trees. The uh, convex concave curves and how they're constructed. A convex curve like this is the weakest point of any, any wall, and so it's important that we put our grids properly. Any overlapping grids should have some, some a thin layer of gravel between them, so we don't have a slip zone in those in this area. 
but this is where you will see if there's any failures, the, the outside curve like this has, it has the most sensitivity. An inside curve, convex curve, it's like an arch, virtually no movement at all, but this is the great grid formation that would be put into that. Same thing with inside outside corners. An outside corner has the most sensitivity to failure. Grids have to be put into two directions and overlap. Again, we want to put some gravel between each one of those layers when we overlap them. And you can see the corner panels back and forth. What I did often as a contractor, I would concrete core fill these units in order to make sure that I didn't have any, any kind of failure in those corners. The inside corner will never move. It's really, really solid. And here's some typical geogrid directional uh, interlock with the face. Here you can see this, this is an example of an inside outside corner and the um, terrace de detail. So we can really do some nice detail work with it these big blocks. Top of wall details. Water is our worst enemy, so we need to make sure that we take care of that. We can put some swales that are concrete or a black top on top, or we can do a more natural swale with the clay details, but make sure that we have our filter fabric separate in those two areas, those zones. Here you can see, as Alan was talking about, the end caps can be attached to the half high, and we can do our nice step down and elevation changes and returns. Top of wall. Another big issue is where do we put our fencing and some of the details that we can do is because of the hollow core, we can concrete core fill these blocks and put our fence posts right tight to the back of the face so we maximize our usage of land behind the wall and we minimize our, our maintenance and also safety factors, especially in, um, in schools or any kind of places where you have the possibility of somebody asking accessing back there. Great advantage of the hollow core. Here we see a different usage. We have our, our coping cap, kind of classic finish on that block. Here's another finished detail on top where they have actually done a swale, a concrete swale, in order to make sure that we protect the reinforced zone from the water on top. Here you can see that the, the, the landscape is brought in but around the details of each one of these returns, softening that landscape, minimizing the erosion issues that might happen there. Failures. We're going to go into these. I hate failures for what it does to our industry, but I love what it teaches us what not to do next time. This project, and I was at this project, there is no gravel chimney in this area for to release hydro pressure. There are no geogrids in this project to interlock with the fascia or reinforce the backfill zone. There's a huge positive slope above this wall. There is nothing right about this wall, not one thing. This wall should never have been built. These blocks are huge. They're, I think, about 3,000 pounds and they landed up three times the height of the wall distance across that 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 roadway if anybody had been in this on this roadway they would have been killed it's 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 a tragedy this was ever built here's another failure but this is a connection failure this was in arizona and it was a Lowe's project that was under construction and they had just finished putting the blacktop onto the parking lot, but they had 
hadn't unplugged all the drains. The water, three inches of rain in three hours came and it flooded the whole backyard, uh, uh, the parking lot, and it came to the wall and blew the face off of the saturated the wall, behind the wall, and blew out the face. This particular product has no grid to block connection, not even a friction connection to this. So it's important that we choose the right system. This is a huge wall, gigantic. The only way, and I was on the site as well to look at it and to give them advice on what they could do, and there was nothing other than they bought all the properties in front of this wall and built a wall, another wall the same height and buried this failed wall. That was the only solution to the failure. Horrendous. So it's important we look at it. Water, 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 water is our greatest enemy in all these projects. This is a global stability failure. The grid, the wall, everything rotated, as you can see. There was a gigantic negative slope below this wall. There's a positive slope above this wall. All the water from the rooftops, backyards, patios, driveways, all led to the back of the wall. The grid, length, the grid lengths on this wall did not cross the global stability failure plane in the back. There wasn't a deep enough burial in order to pass the global stability uh, issue that was going to be up under the wall. So this wall, you can see, is still standing. It's just the whole, the whole reinforced zone, everything collapsed. And water, again, created the saturation point what, that tipped this wall over. Here's another global stability failure. And terraces have a, have a greater amount of requirements for global stability. The total height of these four terraces need to be considered when putting the grid lengths in the bottom. The second, the third course from the top will be, the grid lengths will be as if this is a full height of wall. And the second one will have the grid lengths that we consider as if this is two walls. This is important that we get this design done right on these terrace walls. We can have these terrace walls whatever distance apart, but we just need to consider them as one total wall. The distance between a lower wall and an upper wall before this upper wall was an act on that lower wall is one to two. So if this is a four foot or 1.2 meter tall wall, that needs to be eight feet or 2.4 meters away before this second wall does not add pressure to that lower wall. So it's important that we know how we terrace walls work, because otherwise they fail like this. This is a typical failure that you will see everywhere throughout the wall industry. It's just a standard overturning. There's a number of reasons why this can fail. One is is that the blocks aren't big enough to, or heavy enough to withstand the pressures behind the wall. There's too much hydro pressure behind this wall. There's no geogrids in this wall. There could be also the fact that there's not a proper drainage here. And then sometimes there are reasons why these walls fail. And one of the things that I did as a contractor, I would always consider what would happen to this wall in its lifetime. And sometimes there were things like frost thaw cycling would happen behind this wall and would push over and turn over the wall. I always put geogrids. Our company policy was anything over three feet or 0.8 meters, I automatically put geogrids in even if it wasn't specified. Sometimes on a driveway, the owners bought an RV and they parked their brand new motor home on top of the wall that's live load or in winter in the northern climates they would park they would put bulldoze 
shows all of the snow loads on top of the wall. That's also live loads. There are so many reasons why we need to protect our walls from anything that might happen after the fact. Thank you. It was, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules. It's a great time to be in the wall business. Uh, the wall industry is going to keep growing and growing as we have more pressures on land use. As land gets more expensive, populations grow, especially you can see the water applications and the erosion controls that are going to be required. It's huge growth in the wall industry. It's the right industry for all of you to be in. Thank you guys. Off to Dave. Excellent. Thank you, Vern. That was perfect. Uh, for those of you who don't know Vern, uh, Vern is our president here at Magnum Stone. Uh, he's got nearly 50 years of experience in the industry, uh, 25 years worth being a contractor. So uh, we just heard from one of the gurus of installation. So <laughs> thank you again, Vern. Much appreciated. So some of the, uh, the online resources we're going to touch on today uh, are free on our website at magnumstone.com. Uh, like I said, they're, they're free, they're available at your fingertips. Uh, so we'll just very quickly gloss over them and uh, you can check them out at your leisure. Uh, so the first is uh, to become a Magnum Stone expert with our Magnum Stone Education 101 course. Step-by-step uh, -step installation guides to help with that process. Uh, and as well, the uh, free uh, retaining wall design and analysis software, which uh, one of our engineers, Tolan Hessel, will uh, provide a demo here in just a few moments. So, of course, uh, ultimately, where can you find all of these resources? Uh, just on our website at magnumstone.com. And just up in the top uh, tabs here of installation, education, and software. So that's where these are all uh, all located for easy access. So going with uh, Mayo Stone Education 101. So this is an educational course uh, outlining the key components and advantages of our big block retaining wall system. Uh, as well, there's the step-by-step -step installation guides. Oh, just one second here. There we go. Uh, sorry. <laughs> it's a, uh, a one-hour uh, free online course. Uh, you can take it virtually from, you know, if you're at the office or if you're, uh, you know, at home during the evenings and things like that and just looking to learn more about Magnum Stone. That's a great opportunity to, uh, to learn more. Uh, it also showcases just how quickly uh, or how and why Magnum Stone is quickly becoming uh, an industry favorite here for everybody from installers, designers, uh, architects. You know, it kind of goes from there. So uh, it's a really great opportunity to, uh, to learn more. Uh, next are our step-by-step -step installation guides. So these detailed guides uh, from Magnum Stone cover all of the the different types of retaining walls. Uh, so that includes gravity walls, geogrid walls, uh, positive connection. Uh, and there's also how-to guides for the Magnum Stone curved walls and the, uh, the corners that Vern was speaking about a few moments ago too. So those were all kind of outlined step-by-step uh, -step so that you have the best practices there available. Uh, and we also have the Magnum Stone Technical Reference Guide and the Unit Specification Guide as well, just in case you need any of those information for the, uh, for the design process. And finally, our Magnum Stone Retaining Wall Designer. Uh, so this is a really powerful, easy-to-use system. Uh, 
huge um, both money and time saver for designers. Uh, it has lots of great features like global stability uh, that is embedded in the program so that you can really dive, do a deep dive on the analysis of the retain wall that you're designing. Uh, it also includes multiple methodologies, uh, the retaining wall types, geogrid reinforcement, and uh, all those options are free for the uh, designer to choose from. And again, just kind of some of the additional features would be wall geometry, uh, factor of safety, uh, and much, much more. to be here. Glad so many uh, of you can join us today, especially from all over the world. I'll just share content and hopefully you can all see my screen now. Uh, so yeah, like Dave mentioned, I'm going to go over uh, our software that we've been using to create um, our retaining wall designs. Um, I've been with Magnum Stone a little bit. I do a lot of you know detail designing. Uh, writing specifications, uh, preparing preliminary plans, and doing quantity takeoffs. Um, the software is really easy to use, and you can really quickly uh, get those quantities, um, you know, check global stability, get some analysis reports for calculations. Um, just to give like a quick overview of what this software is capable of. Uh, you can create a report. Here's like a plan I imported. You can see the retaining wall here. Um, I was able to get an, like a wall profile elevation plan up here um, with just a few inputs like the soil down here. Uh, it really easily puts together um, all the quantities. You know, this can take a long time if you're doing it by hand, but with the program, it'll you can just do it like less than an hour, you know, a few minutes. So here you can see you have all the different quantities for the, the cap blocks that Vernon and Alan mentioned, the standard units, base units, top blocks. Uh, it gets the geogrid areas, the, the uh, unit fill areas, the wall area, uh, backfill, really quick, uh, just with a few basic inputs. Um, this is something else that the software pops out uh, after putting in the design. All, all the calculations you might need. Um, really quickly, you know, if you do it by hand, it can take days, but with the software, you can just get all these, you know, the pressures, the forces, factors of safety, uh, you know, all the structural properties, you know, calculations, um, bearing capacities. It's a ton of stuff. I won't go over every, every bit of that, but um, yeah, let's just jump into the software. Here's an icon. Um, there's basically two main functions for uh, the software analysis. You can create a cross section um, and look at you know just that one 2D section of the retaining wall with layout. You can do kind of a full retaining wall design, uh, get those profiles, um, and get, yeah, get the plans ready. So we'll start with just a analysis for cross section, except a disclaimer. Um, and also, yeah, if, if you want to get the software, you just go to the Magnum Stone website, go to the software uh, link here, and you can see this page kind of gives a little intro. Uh, you can see there's a instruction video that will update with you know some more specific uh, instructions. Um, and then, yeah, request for a free download so that you can happily use it. Um, coming back here. Uh, if you have any questions, um, you can also, you know, reference this video that we'll be sharing. Um, also, if you want to contact myself, you can email me at engineering at cornerstonewallsolutions.com. Um, if you're using this for the first time, you might want to hit this getting started link. And it'll come up to this help file uh, where, you know, it kind of goes through the definitions, the design theory, user inputs and preferences 
kind of goes over all the calculations, um, how the software works, all that good stuff. So coming back, you can see the software is kind of set up into different tabs on the left. You got the main like project information, which blocks and geogrids you want to use, uh, the inputs like wall geometry, soils, and then the calculations are the outputs, and then configuration preferences here. Um, I know we have a lot of international people here, so I'm going to do this, uh, this in Imperial, but if you need to do anything in metric, you just click this button right here. Uh, so starting off with project information, maybe we'll put in a project name, the designer. Uh, anyway, moving forward, the first thing you want to do is click the block. So we have some cornerstone options. We'll go to Magnum Stone. Uh, we have a few different options. This first one, you'll see we have some GeoGrid. So this is like the, the GeoGrid reinforced retaining wall design. Uh, we have Gravity, where, you know, no GeoGrid, but we have all these different block options. Uh, if we go to Magnum Stone Positive Connection, we have the GeoGrid again, but with a dash M for mechanical connection. Uh, so for this video, let's just do all so we can kind of mix and match or kind of just compare the two, like a GeoGrid reinforced and Gravity. So I'll choose some available blocks. We have our top blocks. Uh, if you, we also have the option for just a cap block if, to not do the top blocks. Um, you know, the standard block and then mag 48 is basically a standard block with a 24 inch extender. And going back with a 48 inch extender and then, you know, if we just keep adding those extenders, we can have these available blocks in the design. Uh, so we have that and then we want to select as GeoGrid. Uh, let's just go with Centene and that'll prompt us to select our specs. So this goes to our GeoGit properties page, uh, kind of listing out the different specs that we have available for this uh, specific GeoGrid brand. So we can select our primary, secondary, third from strongest to weakest. Um, as Vern mentioned, we'll have the stronger GeoGrids at the bottom of the wall and then uh, our weaker ones at the top. So we'll just select a few different ones for primary, secondary from strongest to weakest. Uh, so now that we have that, we can go down to, well, if we want to change any factors of safety, we're all pretty happy with these default settings. Section information, um, you know, the engineers here might be able to appreciate that we have a few different design methods we can use with the software. NCMA, Ashto, LRFD. Uh, we also, for UK, we have a, a separate software for Eurocode 7. So request that if you need it. Uh, going down to geometry, this is basically, you know, the bread and butter for this software, like all the very specific information you want to put in. So we have, you know, wall heights, batter embedment, slopes, loads, all that good stuff. Um, so for our example, let's just put in a few, few numbers. Uh, we'll do 15 feet, so around 5 meters. We'll do that uh, 2.4 degree batter. You know, can you can do it vertical, 0 degree batter if you'd like, or a little higher, like 4.5. Let's say we have a two foot minimum embedment. Um, we can change our leveling pad. Our standard is six inches de deep and six inches or 0.15 meters, you know, deep and extending past the front and rear of our base unit. Um, for example, let's just, you know, put in a few numbers. Let's say our back slope here is 10 degrees and 10 feet or Let's say that's five feet, so around, you know, a little over, a little under two meters. We have our toe slope here, so let's say it's 10 degrees, 10 feet, you know, around three meters. Uh, let's say our example is by a, a road. Uh, so, you know, let's do 250 pounds per square foot, similar to 12 uh, kilonewtons per cubic meter. Um, let's say that's, you know, pretty close to our wall, five feet, and let's say it's 24 feet, so around eight meters or so. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty basic stuff just to get the wall information in. Uh, if we have some soil properties for our area, we can you know, select our uh, different properties like cohesion, gamma values, phi, uh, you know, angle of friction. If we have different soil information for our reinforced or select fill or you know, the, one, the soil that's gonna be behind our retaining wall, or the retained soil, if you know behind that 
that, that existing soil that's behind our uh, backfill. And then our foundation soils from underneath and our leveling pad, if we want to change that from, we, we do have the option to you know change that to concrete, but our standard is crushed stone. And for gravity walls, we can do kind of a select fill option uh, and choose our angle of excavation if we want to do that. Um, so basically, yeah, that's all you really need to input for a cross section. If we just go straight down to gravity design, it'll create a, a pretty pretty uh, good looking cross section here. You have everything that we put in. We have this toe slope at the base, uh, back slope up here with our live load in blue. This is the select fill for this gravity wall. Um, and you can see for you know 15 foot high wall, it's only eight foot depth. You have our different uh, blocks here. Uh, TBH is top block, top block half high. Magnum stone standard blocks, M048 and M072. So these are 48 inches long and 72 inches long. Uh, so you know, let's uh, just to give a little background on that. Um, Dave mentioned we have some uh, educational resources online. So if you go to the website, hit blocks, scroll down, we can see some of the units that um, Alan and Vern went over. And if we go to the specifications guide, unit specifications guide, pull this up, we can scroll down to, this is some of the units that the uh, software is kind of has in that cross section. So the 48 inch and 72 inch, they're that long, but we have the standard block with a 24 inch extender. And then the same with a 48 inch. And if we have any 96, which we do, will be the standard with a four foot extender and a two foot extender. We can see that all here. Um, and yeah, if we have some results here with our forces, moments, tables, um, everything looks good. We, we might see a, a warning in yellow or a failure in red, but everything looks good now. And if we go just click and reforce design, it's all you have to do to create a cross section here. Um, and yeah, that looks good. We have our geogrids in between our uh, magnum stone blocks. Uh, again, 15 foot high. This one's a little longer for 11 and a half feet. But uh, yeah, that all looks good. So moving forward, we can check the same results, static results, and seismic is blank. We can go back to that. If we get global, uh, we can check their global stability. You know, not all our uh, competitors have you know, this setting in our software, this is something we can check really easily. Uh, so you see those potential failure planes, you can check those global results at different points. Um, and yeah, like I said, software really easy to use, you can check so much information, compound stability as well. Uh, going back, I mentioned you can do seismic. So you can see here, if we do with our gravity design, uh, enable seismic. We have our PGA, uh, 0.2 is our standard default. You can see once we update design, you can see right here for uh, potential failure. Um, so if we hit gravity design again, it kind of redesigns the cross section. And you can see it extended it from a standard to 48. Um, and now it's good to go. Um, and if you want to you know, change anything here, you can just shorten and lengthen these here. Um, just to, you know, easily uh, revise the cross section. If you go to reinforce design, you can see a little yellow warning here. Uh, we ha have similar options here to shorten and lengthen our geogrids, move them up and down, uh, insert more layers or delete layers. So yeah, really easy to use. Just make that a little bit longer and now it's good to go. Um, to make these all the same length, you can just increase the bottom layer, hit that button and it looks great. Um, so yeah, really easy to use. Um, Vern mentioned water analysis is really important. So if we hit water here under geometry, we can enable a water analysis. So it'll ask us for some water options. So let's say we have some water at the base, put in a foot, and then this bottom automatically populates since we have a permeable system. So let's hit update design now. And that actually looks good for the geogrid. We don't have to change anything. For GeoGrid, we should see that there's that red failure for uh, NG for in the bearing capacity for no good. So all we have to do is just lengthen this. So now it looks good, uh, but we do have a longer block 
So, you know, a little more excavation, another option we can do if we want to play around with the software is shorten that again, and then maybe increase the ones blocks over, over top of that. And that, look, that looks good. Um, so yeah, that's basically a quick way to make a cross section. Uh, like I said, that just takes a few minutes and you can easily swap between a gravity wall, geogrid, reinforced wall, or if I chose a different grid option, a positive connection wall. Um, and yeah, just really easy to make that cross section uh, for this for the analysis side of the software. Uh, if we restart and hit layout, or if I can just go straight from view to analysis and layout, so that'll kind of change all the tabs you see on the side here. Uh, but yeah, basically the same deal. Look for a retaining wall design where we can create those reports with uh, elevation plans and profiles. Um, kind of just put in the same input or available blocks and geogrid. Uh, here you'll see our design data. We can. This is kind of set up differently. So here we'll see the soil properties, seismic factors, and basic geometry and our design methods. Hopefully I'm not going too fast for everybody. But uh, so, so after we have those basic uh, preferences and whatnot, uh, we can go just go straight to drawing our wall. So if you have like uh, a, already a plan set up, like a site plan showing where the retaining wall is and those top and bottom walls that you need, you can import that directly here in plan view. Or if you don't have that and just have like the wall chainage and top and bottom of the wall, all the basic values that you need, you can just input it directly here manually. So for this example, let's, I'll just show you how to easily uh, import a plan, hit file, convert to PDF, and we'll select this plan. It'll take a second to load. So here you can see uh, a basic plan for a retaining wall design you can see up here retaining wall um, profile here so the first thing you want to do is get this to scale so we go to a known, known dimension like the scale bar we can zoom in there with this zoom button plus or minus down here and you can see it's about, I think it's 25 inch 25 feet per inch so we'll just take the ruler tool or the dimension tool get this and that's it says here that that's 50 feet or about I don't know, 18 meters or something like that scale drawing over here to update that and then we'll put in 50 up here and then if we delete this old measurement and measure that scale bar again it should be about 50 feet so that looks good so now that is up to scale we can go to our retaining wall and input you know, the, the ends and all the different points. Uh, you can see there's some instructions down here. If you want to read through that, the main thing you can see in all caps is start the line at the left end facing the wall. So we'll go to our tools up here, hit polyline. And since this is, I've looked at this plan, so since this is the toe side of the retaining wall, I'll click on this left side of the wall. And just, you know, hit once there and then hit once at all the different vertices of the wall, double clicking at the end, and now you just have a basic retaining wall. Um, so one thing about the software is uh, it kind of interpolates the data in between all the different points. So um, it's important to get a point for every spot where there's significant changes. Like you can see here, there's a significant change in the toe slopes bottom of the wall. So we'll want to add a point here and here. So all you have to do is click this add poly point function at both ends. Or if you have too many points, you can hit remove point there. So there, there we go. That looks good. That's basically all you need. Um, and hit down here. Uh, we have a couple options for, you know, if you have a curved wall or if you want to add some text. Um, anyway. Once we have this polyline, we'll hit get points. So a table pops up. 
uh, you can see it has a few different options for wall elevations, embedment. Um, if I hit get points down here, you can see this populates with the different uh, coordinates. You can see you have the options if this had like a 90 degree uh, angle or corner in the wall, you can hit inside or outside corner or begin and end radius with the radius length. Um, so yeah, all you got to do is mainly this top and bottom elevations for all these different points. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and do that. Um, I've been looking at this plan, so I'll just pop these in real quick. And if you wanted to, you know, try this, try using the software on your own and maybe practicing with the same plan, uh, we'll be able to share that. So we have this basic information, uh, you know, doesn't take too long. Uh, now you can kind of add these numbers to the plan here if we want to print that out later. Number of points and plot coordinates, you can see those station values in top and bottom of the wall. So once you have that, you just hit send to drawing and that kind of transferred over those values over this next tab, wall layout. Um, so the wall layout, you know, this is where you have to put in your basic information for the wall so the software can design it and create those profiles and uh, cross sections and whatnot. And like I said before, if you just want to put in this information, if you have like a table with your wall elevations and distances and changes, just add that here. So for each point, um, I mean, we could just draw the wall now, but since we want to put in like, if we go to our plan, we can see that there's some toe slopes or some back slopes and there's a road nearby. So we want to add that live load. Um, and we'll want to do that for each different point. If the wall, if the wall was like really uh, consistent and flat, and the road was ne right next to it, we could just put the information at the beginning and the end. And you can see here the program will interpolate between points where the wall is drawn. Um, for now, let's just start with the first one. We'll start with the toe slope. So we'll go back to the plan, uh, hit this dimension. We'll go to the first point. So that's here. Measure that toe slope. So you can see it kind of goes down and levels out. I think that's about 11 feet. You can't read it because it just takes over it, but it's 11 feet. And then I can read the contours. That's about four feet difference vertically. So we'll go here. Uh, if you, you, you want to calculate that slope, so we'll put in, use this calculator and slope length is 11 feet. Slope height is four feet. Hit tab and that gets 20 degrees. So I'll just pop that information in, 20 degrees, 11 feet, zero foot offset. We'll do the same for the back slope. Delete that old one, and then the wall from here to about this point is kind of the back slope where it goes up and then levels off onto the road. So that's also about 11 feet. And then that's also about a four feet difference. Oh, it's the same, so yeah. So let's just put in 20 degrees, 11 feet, zero foot offset. For the live load, we saw that the wall was about 11 feet away. Um, let's say it's 250 pounds per square foot again, same as we'd had for the cross section. For the plan view, let's scroll up and get a measurement for how wide the road is. So how wide that live load is, that's about 27 feet. So we'll put that in. Um, and yeah, that's basically all the information you need for one point. I'm just going to fast forward a bit. I have another table set up with all the different points I put at this in earlier. Um, and yeah, that's basically really all you need to input with the software to draw the wall. So we'll start with that. Next thing you have to do is hit draw the wall. And you have the option for a gravity design or reinforced. Like I mentioned earlier, it's this one of the great things about the software that it's so easy to swap between different kind of walls. If you want to check different designs to see, maybe you have less space for excavation, or you know you want to use different kind of materials accessible. Uh, just see whatever is best for your uh, specific site. So we'll hit reinforce design, and it takes a second for that to design the wall and you can see here I'll hit okay but 
if I go back to this design window, um, it this is basically like a CAD drawing within the program that it created, um, where it creates this profile. So you can see we have the elevations on the left, we have the change on the bottom. If we zoom in a little bit, you can see the reinforcing width, so 10 and a half feet, or around three meters is the geogrid length, the bearing capacity, 1,700 pounds per square foot. If you zoom in, we can see all the different blocks that it requires, and you can see, uh, it might be easier to see in AutoCAD, so we could just save this right here, and go to here, we can see, uh, we have our geogrid layers, magenta here with our lengths. We have all the different blocks, our MS, MG, so magnum stone standard base block, magnum stone standard block and top block. EC is our end corners and you know top block, half high top block. So yeah, really like this is you know really important to really uh, this is really nice to have you know just it's really easily set up from the software. You know, you can play around with this. Um, so that's really helpful. If you go back to the program itself, you can see that it um, it directed us to the quantities, wall quantities tab. Um, and everything's just summed up right here. You know, it did all the work for us basically. So it calculated all the different standard units that we'll need for this project, the base units, top blocks. Uh, it has the wall area. Uh, cap length, a little bit of the unit fill for those units cubic, in cubic yards or cubic meters if we hit metric before. Um, it has all the different um, backfill volumes and that totals. We has, it has the geogrid area for the different specs that are required. Um, so yeah, you know, that just took like, you know, 20 minutes um, and we have all this information, which is, you know, super important to like estimate cost, um, estimate, you know, how much materials are required. Um, so yeah, it's super helpful. And, you know, if we go to re reinforce design, we can go back. This kind of looked like the cross section area. The design kind of split up the retaining wall into different sections and kind of where each point where the wall differed a little bit, if there's like, you know, less blocks vertically at the beginning, you know, in the middle, it might be a little taller. And yeah, you kind of get those same options as before if you want to shorten and lengthen the geogrids, if you want to move them up and down, uh, if you want to go to any section and check the global stability, you can really easily do that. So yeah, just really easy to use. Um, everything you can do really quickly. If we go back to draw the wall and hit gravity design, we can kind of do the same thing. Uh, we can, you know, it gives us the wall profiles that we can open again in AutoCAD. So I have that already up here. All those different types of blocks that I'm, you know, 48 inch units with a standard block and a 24 inch extender. The Magnumstone standard units, it shows which blocks, base blocks are used. Um, and yeah, so I can just print this out on a plan really easily and have that in the field, you know, for construction or whatnot. Um, for quantities, it has this, it kind of, you know, does all the work for you and puts together the sums of different blocks. So all the different blocks you'll need, all the different fill, backfill that you'll need, uh, wall area, everything's, everything that you need right here. Um, and yeah, if you want to get all this information in one spot, you can hit save to Excel down here. Or I, what I like to do is to get like a full report with the quantities in it. If you go to file, print estimate with the elevation view, uh, and print that out, whatnot. I already printed out, so I don't really need to do that. But So that was this file that I showed earlier where we can have that plan imported with the gravity wall or uh, with our retaining wall laid out in red. It has that uh, wall profile at elevation view, or some of our input information, and our quantities right here. So you can see standard units 158, base units 39, 
geogrid areas, uh, everything you might need for construction, just right there. If we go back and let's say, you know, we want to show, um, you know, if we're working with like a DOT, we we'll want to show our calculations. We can, we can go to print design, short or long. And I, I for any cross section, you can just pick one random one, go to file design. If we hit long, I already printed one out. So you can see this one I showed earlier where I picked a cross section and it got in output all the different calculations. Um, so, you know, like I said, this can take days to have, if you're doing it by hand, but with the software, just a few minutes. And it has all the different information, bearing capacities, um, you know, I could share this if anybody's interested, but it's kind of a lot of information to share right now when, you know, not everyone here might need all of this info. Um, and yeah, uh, that's basically everything with the software. Like I said before, if you have any questions, um, you, there's, you know, a contact page on the Magnum Sun website, or if you want to ask me something directly, I can answer really quickly. Uh, you can email me at engineering at cornerstonewallsolutions.com. Um, and yeah, that just about covers that module. A wrap for our 2021 virtual summit, ending a little bit early for you. Uh, again, if you're sharing any Magnum Stone uh, photos or your projects on Instagram or LinkedIn, please feel free to tag us. Uh, you know, we love featuring uh, featuring your walls as they're in progress from installation right through to completion. Uh, so yeah, feel free to tag us. We'll feature the photo and, uh, and give you some photo credit there. Um, there's also going to be a survey sent out shortly. Uh, just a very quick seven questions. Uh, most of them are multiple choice there. So uh, feel free to give us your feedback. We'd love to know, uh, you know how we can improve on our, uh, our webinars and what other information you'd like. Uh, on that note, uh, do stay tuned as well for our future Magnum Stone webinars. We're going to make these more regular uh, with more defined topics. And the recording of the virtual summit will be emailed to all uh, virtual summit registrants here within the next day or two. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Uh, any questions, again, feel free to send them my way to dave at cornerstonewallsolutions.com. Uh, if you had any questions for Vern, Alan, or Tolan, uh, feel free to send them my way and I can, uh, I can pass those along to them as well. And again, thank you to our presenters today, Tolan, Vern, and Alan. Uh, you guys did great, and uh, hopefully everybody learned a little bit more about Magnum Stone, uh, picked up some insightful tips and tricks. And if you have any questions, feel free to let us know. Uh, again, feel free to follow us on social media. And that concludes our 2021 Virtual Summit. Have a great day, everybody.